and welcome to Bedtime Stories. Uh, the idea of this is that um, I'll read a story to you guys out there and um, you can you can listen to it as you go to bed or any time you want really um, by yourself or with some friends. Um, this story that I'll be reading first is called The Temple and uh, it's a four chapter story. Uh, the first chapter is a little longer than the other three so I'll be cutting the first chapter into two parts um, but my advice would be to uh, watch uh, both parts together of the first chapter and then I'll, uh, I'll be posting them at the same time and then you can uh, watch the uh, second, third, fourth chapter as they become uploaded which should be about once a week um, so, uh, without further ado, um, here's The Temple, Chapter 1, Part 1. As Bill Hoefland woke, it took him a few minutes to know where he was. There was a familiar pounding in the base of his skull, and a dryness of the mouth which resembled the consequences of alcohol abuse. As memories of the hours before his sleep flooded his cortex, he realised this was not in fact the case, but rather it was the height that was causing his suffering. The train Hoflin was on was the highest in the world, reaching a whopping 5,000 metres above sea level. At this altitude, those more accustomed to the modest levels of, say, England, were liable to suffer a variety of peculiar and terrible effects, ranging from headaches, nausea and vomiting, weakness and fatigue, the inability to walk, decreased mental status, impaired cerebral function and finally death. As it was, all Hoflin had was a killer hangover, but he wasn't eager to gain knowledge of the next level. He rose in a bunk to a sitting position, consequently banging his head on the roof of the carriage. He winced and rubbed at the bruise. The train lurched back and forth on the track like a man shot through the head, nerves still reeling from the shock of it so the message hadn't quite reached the feet to tell them to lay down and die. If it weren't for the windows, there would be no way of knowing which direction the train was heading, and from where Hoflin was hunched, it could just as easily be hurtling off the edge of space, turning over and over as it fell into the blackness of the abyss. He reached for the ribbed plastic bottle that contained the last of his water and washed back the final egg cupful over his parched mouth and wondered why the altitude sickness had hit him so suddenly so hard. He lay down and slung his hand above his head to see if any oxygen was coming out of the pipe. As the train climbed the mountain range from mainland China into Tibet, it was necessary to pump in oxygen to supplement the thinning atmosphere. It seemed to Hoflin that if such proportions had to be taken when travelling through a place, then it was certainly unnatural for people to live there. But people certainly did. Although no actual people had been seen through the windows for some time, evidence of their existence was still to be found even here. The Chinese were like that. Some may call it was resourceful some disrespectful of natural law, but Hoflin was reminded of a place in Gansu where they had artificially diverted a river and channelled it a thousand miles out into the desert so that they could live there. It seemed to Hoflin to be a prime example of moving the mountain to Mohammed, almost literally so, except of course a river, not a mountain. Either way, Hoflin was sure if and when man colonises the moon, the Chinese will be there first, living under its most harshest of conditions for no reason he could fathom. In fact, the landscape outside the window look, almost looked like the moon. There were no trees or grass or anything green for miles. There were great monstrous yaks, but Hoflin was unable to fathom what could be sustaining them. The yaks appeared to stand completely motionless on the grey mountains, their brown shaggy fur being the only venial specks of colour in an otherwise uninterrupted monochrome landscape of swirling slate grey dunes, ash-coloured boulders and bone-white frozen streams and rivers. The whole vista was one of desolation, 
frost and death. Sure enough, the oxygen pipe above Ho Flynn's bunk was dead. He twisted the nozzle, hoping in vain to bring it to life, but no air was released. From the snake hiss in the air, he knew that others were functioning. He dragged his body over to the edge of his bunk and threw himself into the unoccupied bed opposite. Thankfully, this one had functioning air, so he drank deeply and closed his eyes, hoping to lose consciousness. Thankfully, darkness came. When he awoke the next morning, the headache had somewhat subsided, but the thirst was back tenfold. Hoflin shook his empty bottle, and it rattled like a dry gourd. He pulled his weight over the bunk and clambered down to the scrubby, carpeted floor of the cabin. All other bunks were empty. Yesterday, the bottom bunks had been occupied by a noisy Chinese family who ate cold chicken out of a bag that smelled like dog food, but they were now gone. All six bunks in the room were empty. As Hoflin teetered on uncertain air legs through the car, he passed room after room of empty bunks. It seemed as if the entire car was empty but for him. Hoflin knew firsthand the difficulties with the red tape of getting into Tibet. The reason he was on this train by himself without the others is because somehow there had been a mix-up and his nationality had been printed on his travel permit as American, which did not match his British passport. He had to wait around in Dongjiang for the right papers to come through before he could follow on. He would meet his companions in a Lhasa hotel, so he presumed the other Chinese tra travellers had, had not bothered to try. <clears throat> After the hard sleeper carriages were the soft sleeper carriages. These were slightly more upmarket versions of the hard sleeper, being that they had softer beds and only four bunks per cabin. Per cabin. Hoflitten staggered past these and quickly realised he was the only soul in the whole sleeper section. At the end of the carriage was a water dispenser. He held out his hand and felt the chrome tap. He recalled in pain at its temperature. It was super hot. In fact, the whole train was heated to insane temperatures in peculiar and stark contrast to the clearly frozen wastelands outside. The thought of drinking water at this temperature was inconceivable. Hoflin had witnessed the Chinese's odd superstitions about cold water in Beijing, being told that it was unhealthy and cancer-causing. A droplet of water fell from the tap and hissed into steam as it hit the floor. Even if he wanted to fill his water bottle and wait for it to cool, he was unsure that the thin plastic of his receptacle could withstand the throat-scalding heat. It would buckle and possibly even burst, burning his hands in the process. He continued through the carriages towards the restaurant car. As he opened the sliding door to enter the space between the carriages, he was hit by a wall of icy air, made all the more shocking due to its contrast to the rest of the train. He hopped quickly through the noisy connection and entered the seating area. The seating area was sardine full of people. They were occupying every surface. As he opened the door, every eye turned to point to him. People sat on small upturned buckets in the aisle and were even perched awkwardly on the sinks that could be seen at the distant end opposite the toilets. Approximately a third of the men were smoking pipes and cigarettes and the air was thick with acrid fumes. Hoflin noticed a distinct difference in the features of these people from the people he had met in Beijing and Dongjiang. They lacked the fine features of the Han people and seemed to be a lot less healthy. They had more prominent nose bridges and darker complexions. They looked altogether more weather-beaten. But their more dominant and alarming feature was their bloodshot eyes and veined cheeks. Their eyes bored into Hoflin with a kind of resentful malice that took him by surprise. And although many of them were garbed in robes, they were certainly not the peaceful and friendly-looking Tibetans featured in the guidebooks. Hoflin had a feeling that they were perhaps not even Chinese at all, but were pilgrims on their way from far stranger lands. He had half a mind to turn back to the safety of the sleeper cars, but his thirst drove him onwards. He shuffled past the hordes of old women with yellow stones woven into their matted hair, children with dirt on their faces, and the strange, unearthly men in dark red robes, the colour of the livid veins in their eyes, ever glaring at him. Into the restaurant car he tumbled, and was glad of its relative quiet. There were no diners in the car, just empty places with used chopsticks and empty bowls. Hoflin approached the counter, which was manned by a hand-looking woman in a white cloth apron. 
Wuxiang Mai Bing Shui, Hofeng and expressed with poor pronunciation. Chinese is a tonal language, but Hofeng can never remember the correct tones. It had been Polly Deckard who had the language skills, but unfortunately she was ahead in Lhasa. Hofeng had to rely on a spattering of half-remembered phrases he had picked up in Dongjiang markets. What he had said was supposed to be a request for cold water. Shui meaning water, and Bing meaning cold. Hofeng wasn't sure if she had understood him, as she unleashed a torrent of machine gun Chinese syllables at him that he couldn't understand. Then she finished by repeating, Shui. Hofeng latched onto the one understandable utterance and nodded, Dui, which translates as correct, then repeated again, Bing Shui, and mind drinking. The woman looked at him like he was insane. Bing Shui, she repeated, Mei all, which means not have. Hoflin swore and started to make his way back to the hard sleeper section. If he was to get drinkable water, he would have to wait for the next stop and hop off to buy some in the station. His headache was rearing up again and it, to remind him of his dehydration. He'd read in a guidebook that the best way to avoid altitude sickness was to drink large quantities of water. To remain parched did not seem like a safe option. Okay, that was the end of the first part of the first chapter and uh, if you want to go ahead and read and listen to or have read to you the second part of the first chapter I'd click here um, it should be up there right now um, that would be my advice uh, so I hope you enjoyed it and uh, see you in the next part of the first chapter